Good evening. I know today I'm starting to do this Bible study and I want to apologize. I did it last night and I had the wrong Wi-Fi set up on the computer. So I want to record this because I want this particular new series that we're doing to be recorded on YouTube. And um, so I'm doing it net right now and because it's, it's very important for this whole series to be on YouTube, I believe. It's an opportunity for us to share this and share this message. We're starting a new Bible study this week, and it's going to be on our Wednesday nights for the next nine weeks called Nine Words to Live By. Well, it's not, uh, it's, it's not one of those hard things to, to find out and discover nine words in the Bible that are right there together that we'll find as, as we're talking about the fruits of the Spirit. But it's going to be a different type of study because what I want to ask you to do is I share with you each week a different fruit of the Spirit. Rather than us just teaching on this, we want to apply this. We want these words to live by, to be something that we practice. So what I'm going to encourage you, and I'm going to implore you to do, I'm going to implore you to take the word that we use that week and focus on applying that to somebody's life, applying that to your life, applying that in the church, applying that in an everyday walk, intentionally applying that word and that use of that in in relationships with other people in your relationship with God. And I believe it'll help you focus not just on what you've learned, but on what can help you in your spirit and in the fruits of your spirit. And we'll look at this and we'll start off and share with you some of this. In Galatians chapter 5, the fruits of the spirit we find, it says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we're going to cover all of these over the next several weeks. But as we go into this, I want us to focus today. We're going to focus on the first one, and that is love. Now, that's such a powerful fruit. It's an, obviously, it's an important fruit. In fact, I believe that as we begin to study and we'll begin to find today that this particular fruit is what causes the other fruits in our lives to grow. And we want to talk about that today. Again, when we talk about love, it can there can be so many things and so many misunderstandings that happen as we talk about it, uh, as we talk about this. I've preached on love my whole ministry, but I also want to apply love in my everyday life, in relationships, good and bad relationships. And you're going to have both good and bad relationships in your life. Um, but we... Um, we just, we want to be able to focus on the, uh, how to have love grow in our lives. You see, the issue that should take hold of us is that hopefully after completing this series that we will be able not only to live a fruitful life, but a fulfilling life. And the only way to live a fulfilling life in God is to do it by having those fruits operating in you. And you're not going to be able to live a fulfilling life without the fruit of love in your life. There's so much hate, so much violence, so much, so much disregard for people today that we need as a church, we need as a body of believers to focus on love. And so as I speak on this topic, it, 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 it shouldn't be a touchy topic. It should be a no-brainer, but in fact, it is a very touchy topic. It's one of those things that's very touchy. In fact, it, it begins to get in our business. But you know what? That's what God does. God gets in our business because his business is to change us and to transform us and we can't be trained to transform if we stay the same and even me as a christian and i've been a christian for for 34 years i still can't stay the same i have to grow i have to become better at these things i have to become better at love i was told years ago by a well-meaning meaning church member and if well and a very good friend that he was tired of hearing preachers who only preached on love. Now, he told me this after I'd been the pastor for a couple of months and all he had heard me preach about was love. What he was, in a way, telling me, I want to hear you preach more on hell. I want to hear you preach more on, on these things, on sin and so forth. And, and I believe in that. I believe in telling people, warning people about hell. I know the, that, that hell is real. I believe in warning people about sin and the purports of repentance. But I'm always going to preach it with love because God has called us to love. And in fact, he said that my main commandments, in fact, all my commandments hang on love. Every commandment that God has hangs on love. 
And so it's that important to him. It's that important to our Christian faith. And I looked at that friend, that member, I said, look, I said, yeah, I'll preach on these things, but I'll always do it in love because I'm not here to condemn and I'm not here to judge, but I'm here to love. And it's going to be the key to your Christian faith. Now, uh, the, when we look at the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit are things that we must do. They're kind of the do's of the Spirit, if you would, if you must. And, 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 and those do's. So one of the, the, the first and primary do in the fruits is love. We must do love. And so we were going to talk about that. And there are several different kinds of loves. I'm not going to go into all the teachings about the different kind of loves. I want to talk about love today. And the first thing, if we're going to, if we're going to operate in this, and if this is going to be a word to live by, and we're going to have love in us as a word to live by, what we have to understand and what we have to do is we have to, one, we have to overflow in love. And when I think of the word overflow, I, you, you hear that a lot of times. You know, we hear people talk about, I want an overflow of God's Spirit. Yes, I want an overflow of God's Spirit. As Pentecostals, we want overflow of God's Spirit. But what good is an overflow of God's Spirit if we don't have an overflow of His love? We can, we can shout and we can sing and, 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 and we can dance. We can speak in tongues. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 was part of my daily Bible reading today. And he says, you can speak in all the tongues of men and of angels, but if you have not love, it's like sounding brass, a tinkling cymbal. In other words, it's just making a sound. And I don't want my tongue to be a sound or just a sound. I want it to be something that makes a difference. And that's because of love. It's what we have to have. We live in a day where there's more violence than ever before. We live in a day where there's more hatred than ever before. We live in a day where there's more disrespect than ever before. And the reason we live in a day like that is because love has grown cold in our world. There's so much problems with love in our world right now of course we don't see love overflowing in fact we see a lack of love and it's what's hindering the church it's what's hindering the body of christ because it's it's bad enough that that lack of love is in the world but it's when the lack of love is in the body of christ that's when that's when we're in for troubles you know 60 70 years ago the definitions of love as as americans as people would see on entertainment and so forth, they would see fathers knows best and, 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 and that's where their definition of love may have come from outside the church. And then it trans uh, then, then it began to move and, and then their definition of love came from things like Three's Company or Happy Days, it was a different definition. Then you have um, married with children, what a horrible definition of love that is, or or the shows like Friends and things like that, How I Met Your Mother, those things are not what love is, or what we see on these, what we read in our Harlequin romance novels, or 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 or, or, or the chick flick movies that 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 the rom coms. Those are not the definition of love. What we find about love, you cannot find it from entertainment. You're not going to find it from entertainment resources and sources. You're not going to find love from the media. The only way you're going to find love is going to be finding love through God in our lives, God in the church, God in the believers. If we're going to exemplify love, if we're going to overflow in love, and what I think of overflow, I think of like, pouring a cup of water or something like that and, and you just keep pouring it as it keeps going over the cup. Why would you keep doing that? You know, uh, when, when I clean a cup, what I do is I, 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 I turn the water on and I let the water flow until it flows over the cup and, 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 it, and it can, what, what happens is as it's overflowing, it begins to clean that cup out. It gets the stuff that's been in it for a while. It gets it out. It just I let it overflow and overflow and overflow until finally that cup is clean. Then I'll take it. I'll dry it off. Then I'll use it. And guess what, my friends? That's what we sometimes the overflow of things will clean us out. And when we have enough love in us, it will clean our lives. But here's what we find the Apostle Paul saying in Philippians chapter 1. He says, I pray that your love for each other will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in your knowledge and understanding. Again, I, people always want to hear the don'ts in this world. They want, to, they want the preacher to tell them the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that. And I believe in telling the don'ts. But I'm telling you a do today, and one of the do's is we need to love. And we need to love more. And it needs to overflow. And one place it needs to overflow is it needs to overflow in the church body. It's got to start in the church body, but then we have to overflow it 
out into the world. That love has to overflow out in the world. The world is looking for somebody to love it. And we're not loving what the world does, but we got to love the people of the world. And we got to overflow in it. It needs to have an overflow in us so much so that it changes how we look and our perspective that we see things. Very important that we do that. I mean, when you look at your brothers and sisters in Christ, when you look at the people who you go to church with, you need to walk in and you need to say, man, I love those people. I can't do life without them. I don't want to do life without them. I love those people. You know, there are people in my, I don't want to do life without them. I don't want to do life without you. It's not, it's not enough for my four no more. I've got to have more in my life. And I want, to do, I want to do my life with you because of love. And I want to overflow in that. I want it to be such that people think I'm sappy, maybe think I'm goofy. But that's okay because love is that way. When it's true love, people don't understand why you would do it. People don't understand why love flows and overflows in your life. And so when you walk into the house of God, when you talk to a brother or sister in Christ and you see them out in town, you need to overflow. It should be something with anticipation and beauty that you have because that's what overflow does. And then we take it to our work. We take it to our jobs. We take it to, to, to the community and it begins to change lives. So the first thing we have to overflow in our love. The second thing, love shows God living in us. In 1 John, he tells us this, no one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us. Now, we know that we won't see God face to face. But when I look at this scripture, what I'm finding that John is telling us is that the only way for people to see God is for them to see us loving Him. That's how they see God. Because remember, John said that God is love. And so every time we love others, people see God. Every time we show love to people who don't deserve it, people see God. In this world, they don't deserve it, but you don't deserve to be loved. I don't deserve to be loved, but thank God we are. Thank God we are. And we talk about becoming close to God, and you know, we, everybody says they want to become close to God, but you can't become close to God and not love your brother. You can't become close to God and hate somebody. It just can't do it. Having a God in your life without love is not having God in your life. It's just that simple. Because God living in us will always have love flowing through us. We understand that the opposite of love is going to be found in jealousy, envy, hostility, quarreling, things like that, disrespect for fellow men. And we see plenty of that in this world. We've seen plenty of that in the church in the history. And but when you begin to truly love people, you begin to do it away with jealousy, envy. In fact, you, you, you start being glad God blesses somebody or you really get upset that somebody is hurt. You see, we should, never, we should never glory in somebody's hurt and we should never be jealous of somebody's blessings. But when you have love in your life, you're going to be empathetic when somebody's hurting and you're going to be happy when somebody is blessed. And that's what love does. See, it's the opposite of the way the world sees it. The world is jealous. We want what other people have. We want what somebody else has. You know, we, we, want, we, want, we want what somebody else owns or, 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 or the life that somebody else has or the money that they have or the job that they have because we're never satisfied with ourselves. And part of that is because we don't love ourselves. And, and if you're going to have love in your life, you're going to have to love God. You're going to have to love yourself. And you're going to have to love others. And that's what people will see God in you. And how is it? We want people, we, we want to be outreach oriented. We want to touch people's lives in an outreach way. You can't do it without love. And think about the war, people who are hurting. It's easy for us to criticize the people who are hurting. Somebody's standing over there with a sign. And, and yes, there are lots of people who are taking advantage of the world. But let me tell you, sometimes people are going to take advantage of you. But sometimes it's okay to be taken advantage of when you're showing love. We were in San Antonio a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't see it. I missed it. And um, my wife and them—they were walking down the road, and and we just walked out of a Denny's restaurant, and and there was a man who was who, who was homeless, who was injured, and he was hungry. And they saw this man who was thirsty and hungry pick up a sandwich out of a garbage can, 
And they were moved with compassion to give him what they had. Oh, they, they, they had a cup of coffee with him. It was 100 degrees. And this man would gladly take a cup of coffee that somebody else had been drinking. Eat out of a garbage can. And maybe he had done some things in his life that he shouldn't have. But he needed love. He needed love. Several years ago, many years ago, we had somebody come to our church when we were pastoring in Marion. And my wife had started herself an account. Her daddy had given her money for her birthday. And so she said, she said I'm going to start my own checking account where I can have this. Where I can spend it. Go right ahead. That, that, that's your birthday money, not my birthday money. And so she started an account. And she put money in it. She put, she put her birthday money that her daddy had given her. And she started this, this checking account. And this lady came in. And, and, um, and she came to our church. Showed up one day. And, and oh, I mean, you know, she... She, she, she talked about how the problems that she had, difficulties she had. I remember her name to this day, and, and she did have difficulties. And we helped her as a church. We, we, we helped her pay her rent and, and, and things like that, gave her food and so forth. And, and um, one night um, at church, on a Wednesday night, I believe it was, my wife, she said, she said I, I just feel like the Lord's telling me to give this woman $150. I want to write it out of my personal account. And I, and I knew that there was something sketchy about this woman, but she felt like God told her to do it. And, and, and you know, she, so she wrote a check for $150 and gave it to this woman. And this woman was on crack. She was on different things. We didn't know she was on crack at the time. But, there, but God laid on my heart or laid on my wife's heart to do that out of love and compassion. He said, oh, well, she was taken advantage of. And that, that, that woman, that was, that, that was um, not good stewardship. You know, let me tell you, I want you to understand this. This is what, well, I believe in being a good steward. I also believe in obeying the voice of God. And I'm very comfortable with my wife when she hears from God. We have an agreement with us in our marriage. If God tells us to give something, we're going to give it. Out of, whether it's out of our main account or our person, or, or the accounts that we have that are that we use for different things, um, that if God tells us to give it, we're going to give it because we've been blessed so very much. And and um, and, and yes, this woman, she certainly she ended up on drugs. She took advantage of people. But you know what? When you obey God, you're not being taken advantage of. You're still showing love. And even if this woman was a drug addict, she still needed somebody to show her love. Even though we couldn't change her life, there's somewhere down the road in her life that maybe that woman realized that there was a woman who gave with nothing, with not wanting anything in return because she just simply loved her. I remember Tanya telling me uh, a few weeks later after she felt like she'd been taken advantage of, I said, don't worry about that. God will take care of the money situation. You obey the voice of the Lord because of love. And folks, that's what we need to understand. In this world that is jealous, envious, hostile, quarrelsome, yeah, we may want to be good stewards, but we still got to show love. Even the people who don't deserve it because you didn't deserve it, and I didn't deserve the love. And there might be people who think, somebody was too kind to you or too kind to me when we didn't deserve it. And can I tell you, there have been times where people were too kind to me when I didn't deserve it. But having God's love is something that the world will see. Today, we find in society, and what we need to understand if we're going to walk in this word love and we're going to apply love, love has to be applied to replace racism and class systems. Oh, we don't like to talk about that. Why would we talk about racism and class and where they still exist? Racism, bias, things like that, and class. But here's what, here's what John told us. He said, but if anyone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need and refuses to help, how can God's love be in that person? In other words, if we see somebody that we think is lower class than us and we won't help them, then we, have, we do not have God's love in our life. When we look at somebody and we see them and we see because of their race that there's something, that, that, that there's something wrong with them and we can't trust them because of their race or we can't, we can't help them because of the class. There's they're, 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 they're somebody from a, a, a part of society that, that we would never, you know, they're on the wrong side of the track, so to speak. And, and we, wouldn't, we wouldn't want to do that. But you know, America has a caste system and has had one for since the onset of our country. And, and, and there's always going to be caste systems. There's always going to be class 
And no matter what society you're in, but I go back and I think of Mohandas Gandhi and the story of Mohandas Gandhi and his autobiography. Mohandas Gandhi began to study and, 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 and became interested in the Bible. He was deeply touched by reading this word, by reading this book, by reading the Bible. And he thought, you know what? He said, maybe Christianity is the real solution to the caste system in India because India filled with a caste system. If you weren't part of a certain caste, you couldn't cross over those boundaries. And, 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 and Gandhi had, he, he, he protested those particular things. Well, one Sunday he went to a church. Now he's a Hindu, he's an Indian, and to attend services. And he decided to see the minister and ask for instruction in the way of salvation. And, 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 and he was interested in becoming saved. And the ushers refused to seat him. And they suggested that he go and worship with his own people. We don't want you worshiping here because you're not the right color. And Gandhi left and never came back. And he said, if Christians have caste system, caste differences also, I might as well remain a Hindu. And just think, because he was thrown out because he wasn't the right color, he remained in a religion that could never get him to heaven. But if they would have welcomed him in with open arms and said, Gandhi, we love you. We want to give you Jesus Christ. Let me tell you a story. Two years ago, me and my wife went on our 30th year anniversary to, to Branson. And it was, uh, we, we, we were having a good time. We woke up on, on our anniversary, which was on Wednesday of that week. And on that particular morning on our anniversary, the first thing that happened is I got a phone call. The phone call told me that one of the air conditioner units in this church had gotten stolen while I was gone. And so I was dealing with that. And, and, and so I was already frustrated. This is our anniversary. I'm thinking about that. And, 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 and you know, I'm mad about that. And, and, and even in those things, I still prayed for the salvation of the people who were stealing those things. And, and so forth. We went to lunch. And we went to lunch in a Mexican restaurant. Now, you know, when you go to Branson, you don't go to Branson to eat lunch in Mexican restaurants. We got 15 or 16 of them here in our community. And so I can eat that same food here. But we, we wanted to, my wife wanted to go there. So it was on our anniversary. We went there for lunch at this place. And, and so we're, we're, we're eating. We go into this restaurant. And I had, we had just put masks on. Brother Don was just about to go in the hospital. Um, and we started doing the masks where they said, Roto Road Church of God on them. Make your life count. And uh, that Sister Barbara had made. And. And, and so we have, the, we have those masks on and we walk in the restaurant and the guy seated us, his name was Samuel. Samuel was from Turkey. And Samuel seated us and when he came back to our table and he began to take our order, he looked at my mask and, 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 and he said, are you a Christian? And we said, yes, we're Christians. And he looked at my wife and, funny, and, and he said, well, do you like your pastor? She said, yeah, I love my pastor. In fact, I'm married to my pastor. And so he began to talk to us and and began to share with us. He said, well, he said, I'm from Turkey. And he said, of course, Turkey is a, mainly a Muslim nation. And he said, I'm from Turkey. And I came to America to get an education. And I went to a school. And he said, you know, one thing I found in the religion that I was raised in, it was filled with hate and violence and hate and violence. And, 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 and Samuel told us and he shared with us that about the hate and the violence that he'd seen through um, Islam and, and through practicing the Muslim religion. And, 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 and so he shared that with us. He said, he said, at the school I go to is a Christian school. And he said, I begin to see the love that comes with Christianity. And I wanted to become one. And so I gave my heart to the Lord. And I'll tell you this to let you know what happens is this young man saw Christians living with love in their lives. And it changed his life. And now Samuel's a Christian. He didn't tell us that story to get a big fat tip or anything. He, well, he told us that story because he saw that we were Christians. And, and we pray for Samuel even two years later. And I thank God for that. Understand, folks, that love does away with the caste systems. It does away with those things. Love also does something in us that will cause us and help us to forgive and forget. And one of the great things about Christianity is forgiveness. Now, keep understand. I know that there are some, those of you that you're dealing with things in your life from people who have hurt you. And, and, and we all have those. And some people that maybe you even have to do away with relationships because they're toxic. I understand that as well. 
But we still have to walk in forgiveness. But I can't forgive without love. You see, but love helps me to forgive and forget. Peter said this, he said, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other for love covers a multitude of sins. You know, every one of us will make mistakes. We're all going to sin. We're all going to do things. But you know, love helps us get past those things. I'm not saying people shouldn't be accountable for their sins and mistakes. We all absolutely should be accountable for those things. But love helps us get past those things with others. Love helps us move into a different a, a different view of that. When I see somebody sin, sin instead of me relishing and, and glad for them to fall, I want to love them enough to restore them. And there are people, there are people right now that I'm praying for, that I'm asking God to restore, who, they're, who, who have gotten involved in hatred and ugliness and things like that. And they still need to be loved. Even if it's a relationship that I can't have, I still want to pray for them and pray for the love of God to touch them. And I pray for their souls daily because I don't want anybody to go to hell without Jesus Christ. But love covers a multitude of sins. To be perfectly honest, the longer you live, the more people you come in contact with, the more people will let you down and will hurt you. And the more people that you will have to forgive and you'll have to forget. And if you can't walk in forgiveness and you can't forget things, then you're not walking in love. And I challenge you to walk in love and to have this love in your life that will help you to forgive and forget. Jesus said, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Look, you're going to have people that hurt you and are your so-called enemies, but you need to love them. You must love them. In fact, it was a command from Jesus. We have to love people and forgive them even when it's hard. And I'm not saying it's easy. But again, I'm talking about us taking this word love and us using it this week so that it changes our life. My friend, let me tell you, this, that anything that keeps you from loving people can keep you from heaven. Anything that keeps you from loving people can keep you from heaven. The author of Hebrews said, See to it that no one misses the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I heard somebody tell me this several weeks ago. I told them in my office they needed to forgive. They needed to forgive somebody for something that, that, that they were holding on to. They've been holding on to it for 20 plus years. And this person told me, they said, I love you, but I would rather go to hell than forgive this person. And I was, I, I was astounded I, that, that somebody would tell me that. Folks, unforgiveness is toxic and it's opposite from love. And love helps us to forgive people no matter what they do to us. Doesn't mean we have the same relationship we always had with them. But we, we, we have to, I, for somebody to say they would rather go to hell than, than forgive tells me they're not in their right mind and they're not in their right spirit. And we have to pray for them because there's nothing worth going to hell over. No amount of hatred, no amount of money, no amount of, no amount of discord, Nothing is worth going to hell over. Everything is worth loving people. And every person is worth loving. Finally, love has to grow as a fruit. Jesus gave us this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two commands hang all the law. When he said this, he says, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. He said, this is the first and greatest commandment, okay? But then he said, a second is equally important. Did you know Jesus said it's just as important for you to love people as it is for us to love God? Well, it's easy for us to love God. It's easy for me to love these people here. It's easy for me to love this congregation. It's easy for me to love each of you. But it's hard for me to love the people of this world. And oh, we've gotten to where 
our love doesn't grow as a fruit because I can't love Democrats or I can't love Republicans or I can't love independents or I, I, I can't love capitalists or I can't love socialists or I can't love communists or I can't love blacks or I can't love whites or I can't love Hispanics or I can't love Asians or I, I you know, we, we've got all these different requirements and tendencies on love when love is supposed to be a fruit and we're supposed to spread that fruit and put it in other people's lives and understand this, we're supposed to overflow with love in such a way that that we can love and should love anybody and everybody in spite of what they've done, who they are, where they're from, what they have, what color they are, how, what, what gender they are, how old they are, how young they are, how rich they are, how poor they are, how mean they are, how nice they are. That's the kind of love we're supposed to have for everyone. Jesus said this about this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The only way people are going to know that we're his disciples is if we love them. Here's my challenge to you. This is the word to live by for this week and that word is love. And my challenge to you in living by that word, I'm encouraging you for the next seven days to take this word and apply it to your life. Apply it to the lives of others. Apply it to your relationship with God. I mean, go intentionally and show love to people. I know it may be uncomfortable. Go intentionally and show love to strangers. Go intentionally and show love to, to others. Go intentionally and spend time showing love to God. I want to pray for you. What I want to do, I want to pray for you right now. And I'm going to pray this prayer. Now look, I understand that when we intend to do something on the spiritual side and love is spiritual... But it's also actually when we tend to do it, the enemy's going to attack it. So he's going to attack you. But make no mistake about it. But here's what I want you to be encouraged. I want you to, I'm going to pray this. And in spite of any attack that you face this week, let your love overflow in the lives of others. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, I ask you to touch, dear God, these precious folks, dear God, with an abundance and overflow of love. Dear God, let... Help, I pray for them to take the love that they have in their lives that's been given to them by you and dear Lord, that they put it in other people. That they are challenged, dear God, to love neighbors, to love co-workers, to love other students, to love friends, to love enemies, dear God. That they're challenged, dear God, to love people enough to pray for them and to seek you on their behalf. God, I pray, dear Lord, that they would overflow with their love. God, touch this church. Let us love like never before. Let us love each other. And let us love the, world, the community. In the name of Jesus. Let love be a word for us to live by. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you Sunday. I'm so excited to be with you. God bless you.